Welcome back to the Valley to Peak Nutrition Podcast. This week begins a two-part series with the Director of Coaching at Uphill Athlete, Chantel Robitaille. As you'll hear, Uphill Athlete has built a reputation on helping people better be prepared to take on the mountains from a physical standpoint. I'm joined by Chantel, who doesn't just work for Uphill Athlete, but she's got a background in high-altitude exercise physiology. There's no one better suited to talk about the topic. Part one looks at exactly that. What are the things to consider when going to high altitudes? What are we not doing that we should be? What are shortcuts that we're trying to take that are a complete waste of our time? What if we live in an area that's basically at sea level and we have no time to adapt? Are there anything that we can do differently to prepare? We dive into that and so much more in the episode. Probably goes without saying, but all of the information that Chantel and I discuss are informational only, not to serve as medical advice. We talk about some fairly advanced techniques of training in part one and part two that could potentially push some folks into the upper limits of their capabilities, which could have negative implications if you've not built a base to support that. If it's something that you're interested in and you feel like it warrants it, you should definitely check with your doctor before attempting any of it. So with all that red tape out of the way, let's dive into episode number one with Chantel from Uphill Athlete to learn more about what it means to perform at higher altitudes. I don't want to do you any injustice by leaving something out or including something I shouldn't. So I'd love to just start with an introduction of who you are, your background, your personal interest in how you got involved with, you know, uphill athlete and really the endurance, the endurance community and and then take it from there. Sure. I'd be happy to. Um, well, my name's Chantelle Robitaille. I am the director of coaching at uphill athlete. And Uphill Athlete is a coaching company that works with predominantly mountain sports athletes. So we work with trail runners, mountaineers, climbers, trekkers, um, anyone really that wants to get out and challenge themselves in the mountains. And we don't work with, you know, just professional athletes. We actually work more with athletes who are also professionals. So people that are challenging themselves out in the mountains, doing a variety of different things. Um, but they also have lives, <laughs> you know, they are moms and dads and they have businesses and they have jobs and, um, they're preparing for all different sorts of challenges in the mountains. So we work with a ride, wide variety of people. Um, we do one-on-one -on -one coaching, we have group coaching programs, and we also have programs that people can purchase and sort of follow on their own. So we have also a lot of free uh, resources on our website and a free forum where people can get in touch with our coaches as well. So we try to provide lots of different options for people who are trying to learn a little bit more about the art and science behind training. So did I'm curious, did you grow up interested in this or did your parents take you into the mountains or what really drew you towards that to want to pursue as a, as a profession? That's a good question. I did not grow up in the mountains. I grew up in uh, Northern Ontario in Canada. So I grew up in a pretty remote place with snow most of the year um, and hills, certainly, but not mountains. And I grew up actually playing hockey, coaching hockey and doing a lot of hunting, actually. So I spent a lot of time um, stalking around in the woods and um, learning about you know, reading maps and orienteering. And um, I did a lot of stuff on my own as from a pretty young age um, out in the wilderness. And that just sort of grew over time to um, getting into adventure, uh, adventure racing. And I also um, then got into sort of trail running. Um, I had an opportunity to live in Switzerland for about 10 years. And that's probably where I got more into trail running, um, mountaineering and climbing. I didn't, I had no idea you were into hunting. Yeah. As a, as a kid, we kind of had to, it was expensive yeah. to get food when we, when you live in such a remote place. And, um, yeah, I learned a lot of ways to prepare a moose. You know, it's a big animal when you, when you knock one down, you have to, you have to get creative. So, um, yeah, I grew up hunting from a pretty young age. Yeah. And so I guess, I guess for context, for people that are listening, you and I had, met cross paths or whatever, um, when I had reached out and, and you had talked to uh, a friend of ours, Anthony Oberti, who's a friend of several people who listen to the podcast and sort of, we both reviewed with you our experience with our death hike in Alaska last year and sort of talked about what our plans were, um, for this upcoming year. And so you and I had went back and forth and I have to say, I said this to you in an email and I'll just say it publicly. 
you're so you're great at communicating and very very um accommodating right and that that draws people to want to be coached by someone like that and so as you as a director of coaching my understanding is is that your responsibility is really to listen to the person that's wanting to get help and try to pair them with a coach at uphill athlete that you feel like either a has experience in what they're trying to do or b would pair well with them you know just on a on a personal level or a combination of both and so you'd said well you know just schedule with me and so naturally whenever you find out who your coach is going to be you do a little a little google digging <laughs> And so I got on the uphill athlete website and and Googled who you were because of course I had no idea, like, you know, the, the way that I was exposed to uphill athlete initially was through the book that we talk about all the time on here, which is, um, the, um, I always get the, the name mixed up, but the training new for the new alpinism training for the new alpinism. And so you think of like Steve who wrote it, <laughs> but you know, there's other people who are under him. And I noticed in there and what really drew me to want to find out more about the topic that we're covering today is that you've got some postgraduate work in exercise um, physiology with high altitude with folks who, who, who predominantly do their sport at higher altitudes. What, what initial, cause there's so many things that you could get a postgraduate degree in. <laughs> what drew you to something so specific as high altitude environments especially knowing that you kind of grew up coaching and being really involved in hockey versus that maybe if, if the roles were reversed where you grew up in Switzerland doing a lot of mountaineering, I guess that would make more sense. It's not to say that it's wrong. Of course, I'm just curious mm -hmm. what draws you to it or what drew you to it. Well, when I lived in, um, when I lived, moved to Switzerland, I had previously um, been pretty active in the adventure racing scene. And when I moved to Switzerland, I didn't have a team anymore. So I had to find something else to, you know, some other place to put my energy. And I always, you know, I always loved to run. I had done some, you know, marathon running and always kind of, you know, have been coaching something on the side you know, almost all of my life. And so I was sort of a running coach on the side of my professional job, which was not coaching. Um, and then as I started getting into more trail running, and then I wanted to do more ultra running. So running, you know, longer distances, um, up to 100 miles, there really wasn't at that point in time, there wasn't a lot of information about how to coach someone for that type of um, endeavor. And a lot of it, you know, when I, since I was in the Alps, I was competing in a lot of high altitude environments running and the way I would train for a marathon, you know, on a road was totally different. And so I was trying to find ways to help myself and help, you know, a few other people that I was helping out. And I just felt like I was a little bit at a loss and um, was at a point where I wanted to sort of do something a little different career wise and decided that I was just going to go all in that I wanted to dedicate myself to to coaching and helping people prepare for endurance events in the mountains. And the best way that I felt to do that would be to go to grad school. So I left Switzerland and moved to uh, Colorado to get my graduate studies. And um, I was really fortunate to go to Western Colorado University, where I was able to earn a master of science degree with in uh, exercise physiology with a focus on high altitude, uh, which was super cool because we were living at a high altitude. And then we could also do a lot of uh, training and work with a lot of athletes and do a lot of studies uh, at higher altitudes from where we lived in Gunnison, which is at about 7,200 feet. Um, so it was pretty, pretty cool. It was great training ground and great place to learn. So this is a, this is a broad question, but I'm curious from your time in that, is there anything that stands out to you as being like in, in your, in your, your didactic work, right? You're, you're studying. Is there anything that stands out to you as just being like, I don't want to call the most mind blowing thing, but just the most aha really resonated with you and stuck with you throughout all of your education. And even now in your coaching that you learned about athletes in high altitudes. Wow. What an amazing question. Um, what I realized, probably the biggest thing, you know, kind of going back into, into research and my undergraduate studies were in science as well, is just the 
individual variability within humans. Like you could put a bunch of people on the same, you know, who, who appear to be almost the same. You could give them the same kind of training program and they're all going to respond differently. You could prepare people for um, going to altitude the same way and they're all going to respond differently. And it's probably much the same as your profession where you could take some people that have some similar things about them, right? Same weights, ages, heights, et cetera. And you could put them on the same uh, eating program or diet um, and their bodies are going to respond differently. And that to me was pretty fascinating because if I think about how I had trained, you know, approached training before, obviously as a coach, I knew I had to train people a little bit differently based on who they were and what their backgrounds were and so on. But this really drove it home. And with, with altitude, because there are so many different things happening in the body, it's just like, to me, it's miraculous what our, you know, when I was able to actually understand all how all the different systems in the body are changing to help us survive at altitude, I still think it's amazing. Like human beings and human bodies are just amazing creations. I I agree. I, you know, so I uh, sort of the same as you, I grew up in Indiana, <laughs> right? I mean, basically mm-hmm. like the flattest place on the planet, no exposure really to the outdoors until I moved to Idaho, however many years ago it was, and then just really fell in love with, with the outdoors. And of course that includes, includes the mountains. But as a part of that, just the, the idea of high altitude fascinates me still. And, you know, like, so here are some of our some of the peaks that are closest to us will reach 10, 11,000. Some of the highest peaks are 12, six, and they're a little bit a ways away from us. And that's high altitude. Yes. That, that fascinates me too, but I am um, enthralled with documentaries about Everest and about K2 and about some of the stuff over in the Himalayas. It's because it just blows my mind that people are at, you know, the cruising, the cruising altitudes of jets with no oxygen climbing some of this. And so I'm, I'm also curious with your, you know, your experience in learning about that. What are some of the most standout things that you have found at changes that happen in humans at altitude? Well, I think like that, like I said, to me, it just felt like when I was learning about it, it just felt like miraculous how adaptable our bodies are to survive in different environments. And also to see like for people like us that have not grown up in these, you know, looking at people, for example, who have grown up in Nepal in much higher elevations, their bodies are different um, because of how they've grown up. Their bodies are very well adapted to to their environment and how is it that people like us that come from much lower elevations with no exposure to that how is it that our bodies can actually survive in these really extreme environments so i think that's super cool and for anyone who's gone to to you know a higher altitude you know whether it's been for just you know think about a lot of people for example when i moved to colorado i would see a lot of tourists coming And there'd be a lot of tourists also going to the emergency room because, you know, there'd be like probably one in four people would have problems with the elevation. And that's pretty high, right? What do you think about that? Um, The amount of people that are going to have trouble and understanding like the body is well prepared to help you survive at altitude. But there are a lot of actual underlying conditions that um, will hinder that process and will put someone into into trouble. And so I remember being like younger and not really understanding a lot about altitude and always hearing like, oh, well, the air is thinner and there's less oxygen. And so I think one of the 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 thing that I think a lot of people are surprised about when I share this with them is that no matter what elevation we are at, there's actually the same percentage of oxygen all the time. It's always 21%. And what's different is that we have a difference in the air pressure that's around us. So that means the density of oxygen changes. So the percent of oxygen around us is always the same, but the amount of oxygen particles in the air that we're breathing in is going to be less. And so when your body um, gets the signal that um, this is happening and that you're breathing in less oxygen with each breath, then 
there are some changes that your body starts to make um, because this is a this is a stress. It's a hypoxic stress. So some of the things people will initially notice, they'll maybe notice that their um, heart rate is a little bit higher. Their breathing is a little bit faster. And you might also notice that suddenly you're going to the bathroom a lot. You're peeing a lot. And these are all really normal changes. Um, if for anyone who's ever maybe for the first time going to altitude, maybe they've gone somewhere for a ski trip and they might notice that they're not sleeping very well because they are not breathing very well at night or they are constantly waking up kind of gasping for air, like suddenly develop sleep apnea and all these things that can be kind of scary, but they're all normal responses to altitude. And it means that your body's getting the signal that it needs to get to make some changes um, to help you survive. And I think that's kind of the cool thing to think about. It's, uh, that fascinates me. And I've got so many questions based off that. <laughs> so uh, I guess my first question is just, just, just speaking directly to one of the things you just mentioned. If you, so a prime example, um, someone had reached out to me about high altitude environments and nutrition approaches or even training approaches to try to reduce, to try to be less symptomatic when they showed up. So in other words, they wanted to experience less of these symptoms and the curiosity was always, is there anything that I can do? So a question that I've got for you, and one of the things that he had noticed, and you just mentioned it, is you'll be sleeping in a tent and let's call it, you know, let's call it at a moderate elevation of 10,000 feet. Although this, this person might live at sea level or slightly above sea level. Mm -hmm. You wake up in the middle of the night, just gasping for air. Is that a result of your respiratory rate being off and all of a sudden trying to compensate because there's not enough oxygen? Yeah. And it's a signal that actually your brain is getting and it's waking you up. Um, and it's like, it's like your body has sort of forgotten how to breathe. And then there's kind of a panic response. And then your brain's going to wake you up to get you to breathe again. Um, the interesting thing about this, the sleep apnea, um, and this might be something interesting as you're talking with, um, clients coming to you for advice is that, um, men are most likely to get experience this where most women won't, um, but many men will. And it doesn't even have to be a high elevation. There's, you know, a lot of times people are going to experience this even around 6,000 meters or 6,000 feet rather. So like think about, you know, sort of Denver's elevation uh, or Jackson, Wyoming's elevation. They could still potentially experience that. So that's still, you know, um, obviously it's a big difference from, from sea level. But what's interesting to think about is that at, you will start to um, feel a difference in your, there will be a difference in your maximum aerobic capacity, even at 3,200 feet. You'll have 5% less of your maximum aerobic capacity. And when you get up to, let's say 15,000 feet, that goes down, that goes, you know, you're going to lose 30 to 35% of your maximum aerobic capacity. So think about it. You're working at like 65 to 70% of your typical capacity at sea level, which is pretty significant, right? Um, Wait, makes a big difference. Question. And even at, and if you go, yeah, sure. And if you go even higher, you think about like 16,000, 15, 16,000 feet, your body is going to have a 20% increase um, in the, in the demand in your cardiac output just to breathe and circulate your blood. So what does that do to your muscles, you know, and the ability to move around? You're not just going to, you know, sit up there for the whole time. Like, obviously, you're going to have to spend a little bit of time sitting around and and waiting. But um, it makes sense that um, you're going to you're going to struggle a little bit. And with the sleeping, because the um, the difference between your typical rate of oxygen intake and carbon dioxide um exhalation changes, that is what leads to that sort of transient uh, bit of sleep apnea that you might experience. Fascinating. So is there a, and I'm, I'm, I'm sure that like you, you had mentioned this in our first email together and you hit the nail on the head and I laughed to myself when you'd said it, the ever present, but always dreaded answer of it depends. I'm sure that that's going to be here when I ask this <laughs> to, to some yeah. degree. Is there a like 
is there a time that this takes to develop? So for example, let's say that a family is driving over a mountain pass headed to the Tetons from Idaho, a little bit of a different elevation, not a ton, but you go over a pass and it climbs quite a bit. Obviously in that five minutes, it's not going to develop. Would it develop on average? Would it take a day, two days, a week? Is there a set amount of time where someone could expect some of these symptoms to start showing up once they are at an altitude that maybe their body's not accustomed to? Yeah, that's an, that's an awesome question. And there are some, you know, what I can give you is sort of like typical, um, expectations. So the typically, you know, the immediate change that people are going to notice is that, um, their breathing rate's going to increase and the heart rate's going to increase. And that's pretty immediate, you know, if you, and you've probably noticed that yourself, even if you're you're hiking, you might feel like, okay, my pace is slowing down, but I'm still breathing pretty hard or heart rate is beating pretty fast. And that's, that's pretty normal because your, your body is getting a signal that there's less, um, you know, less availability of oxygen. So how do you get more oxygen? You breathe faster, you breathe harder and you get more in when you do that, your heart rate obviously is going to increase. Um, and then as that, you know, your body, gets that happening, then that signals other stuff to happen. So within, you know, those are the immediate changes. And then within a couple of days, you will also, um, you might notice that you're peeing a lot. Um, and that's happening for a couple of reasons. One main reason is that your body is kind of dumping plasma to increase the density of your red blood cells. And so that's going to give you better oxygen carrying capacity, right? It's going to have more oxygen in your blood. So you'll, that'll start happening within a couple of days. And that's also going to help protect your brain, right? We need some, we need some blood and some oxygen going to that brain to keep us alive. However, in those first couple of days, before those changes start to happen, you might feel a little bit woozy. You might get a little bit of a headache. Um, you might feel a little bit slow or, you know, silly, and that's totally normal um, until those, you know, other changes sort of start happening. Um, and that's why it's really important that we pay attention to hydration because we're losing uh, a lot of fluids in the body. And then around day 10, we have another cool thing that happens. And this is where we start, maybe start feeling better around this point and feel a little bit more quote unquote normal is that um, the, you know, as these changes are happening and your um, kidneys get a single to signal to start producing EPO, erythropoietin. Um, and that might ring a bell if anyone has, you know, read stories about blood doping and Lance Armstrong, but this is actually, um, you know, this is, this is a, something that our bodies can naturally produce. And, um, you know, yes, of course you can, you can dope with it, um, you know, and get it externally, but it is something that our kidneys will naturally produce within the body. And with, when that hormone is produced, it also helps our body. Um, it stimulates our body to produce more blood, red, more red blood cells in the bone marrow. And it also helps regulate the concentration of red blood cells and hemoglobin in our blood. So you can think about like from a performance perspective, this is helpful for athletes, right? Because it's the red blood cells that shuttle the oxygen to our cells, including our muscle cells, allowing them to operate a little bit more effectively. But this also, you know, helps us at higher altitudes when we have greater need for oxygen because there's less around us. So you need, uh, and I know it depends, but on average, really 10 days to acclimate be start, before you start getting pretty favorable, favorable responses from the body that say, okay, we recognize what's going on here. We're going to start ca cascading a series of effects to take place to help you to, to do well here. That on average is, is 10 days. Yeah, that's about 10 days till that kicks in. And then you also have like within that same time frame, once the EPO starts being produced within sort of that same window, sort of 10 to 10 days to two weeks, you'll start noticing that your heart rate is going to normal come down a little bit. It's not going to be what it was, you know, at home, at your home elevation, but it is going to normalize and um, come down a little bit. You're going to have better blood flow to your brain and throughout your body, throughout your muscles. And. And so you're going to notice that, you know, you're going to be able to feel a little bit better. You're going to be able to perform a little bit better as well. But that, um, 
that EPO production actually, you know, kick starts kicking in around the two 10 day mark, and then it'll keep, um, keep going for about three months. So, you know, the longer you're at altitude, obviously, the better it's going to get. But, um, you know, some of the other changes that you start noticing initially, some of those things will start to settle down uh, within about a two week period. And you will have a much better oxygen carrying capacity in your blood after about two weeks. So you will start to feel a little bit better. Your breathing will be a little bit more normal and your um, distribution of red blood cells, plasma, and and things like that will also start to kind of level off and normalize. Does does the 5% reduction that you'd mentioned at 3,200 feet and the 30 to 35% reduction at 15K feet, does that start to improve at that point? Or are you, I'm, I'm sure that you'll still be at some sort of a deficiency compared to maybe sea level, but does that, does that piece improve then too? The thing is, is that your, your um, capacity is still going to be diminished and it's probably still going to be diminished by that amount. And so when you ask me, is there something we can do before going to altitude? Yes. Because if you think about the fact that you're going to lose, um, you're going to lose a good chunk of your maximum aerobic capacity. That means the better capacity you start with, the better you're going to be, right? So that means if you start at a better um, better fitness level, you're still going to lose some, but the better you start, then the decrement is going to be, you know, that much less noticeable compared to if you were not very fit or you weren't training well before you went. Um, that would certainly be, you know, you would definitely have more difficulty. So that's the biggest thing is to, um, you know, the fitter you can be the better. And also the other thing I would say is to make sure that you're doing all the right things to prepare yourself beforehand. So yes, train, you know, train well, um, but rest well a little bit before you're heading out for your big adventure or heading off on a climb or expedition or something like that. But knowing now that I've talked about these changes within the blood, you also want to make sure that you're healthy. You don't want to be overtrained. You want to make sure also that you're, um, you, I would typically recommend people to, and you don't want to do this maybe two weeks before you want to have time to course correct if you're deficient anywhere, but getting a good solid blood panel done, you know, making sure that, um, your ferritin stores are in a good place, that you're not anemic, that you're not deficient in any important, um, minerals or things like that. You want to make sure that everything is in a good place and you want to do this, you know, earlier so that if you do have something that's a little bit off, that you have time to correct it and get yourself back into balance. Can you, and like for people who maybe don't know, can you speak to the value of showing up not anemic? Because, you know, people will, uh, sometimes they'll ask like, what are some nutrition things that I can do? And my answer is always the same arrive early and acclimate and make sure that your iron stores are full. Could you explain the value of, of what that, that does in terms of being able to acclimate well? Yeah, absolutely. So if we think about, you know, the, you know, some of the changes I mentioned that are happening within the body, our body is trying to increase the density of our red blood cells and increase hematocrit. And if our iron stores are low, that's going to hinder that process. And if those natural processes that protect us and help us survive at altitude aren't able to happen, then that's where we're going to have someone that's going to be putting themselves at a higher risk for um, AMS or acute mountain sickness. What, and this is, this is backtracking a little bit, but so you, let's say that, let's say that you, you go through the process of 10 to 14 days, you do all of that. You're even, let's say, even say that you're doing some sort of a summer long study or work group or whatever. And you, and you find yourself in those mountains for that magical three month period where you're just continuing to adapt and continuing to adapt. Then you go home. How long do those effects stay with you before they diminish entirely or do they ever? Will a person that's acclimated at really high altitudes at some point and, and they go to revisit that same altitude years later, will they acclimate better than maybe someone who's never been to that altitude before? Yeah, that's a, that's an awesome question. And definitely one that I will say I get a lot and it really depends on the person. For some people, they find that, um, the more 
exposures they have to altitude, the easier it gets. So for some people, their bodies are able to, you know, it's like they've, it's like they've, um, each time they go, they, they feel like it takes them less time to acclimate. So some people are lucky that way. For some people, there's no pattern. Um, you could have some people that maybe have gone to higher elevations and they've never had a problem. And then all of a sudden they go this one particular time and have a really bad issue. Uh, for instance, I had an athlete that I, I worked with for several years and he was a trail runner and did a lot of higher altitude races in the mountains, never had any problems. And one year he went to run Leadville and he got up to Hope Pass. So he's around, you know, 10,000 feet, started feeling pretty badly and ended up blacking out and having to be, you know, taken off the mountain by helicopter. And he hadn't done anything different than he normally would. He was taking good care of himself, eating and drinking well, um, you know, wasn't dehydrated or anything like that. So there was no rhyme or reason. And so this is why, you know, for one thing that I recommend to people is that you never really know how you're going to do. So the best thing you can do for yourself is to monitor your symptoms on a daily basis. So take note of, you know, how did you sleep last night? Um, you know, what's your fatigue level like? Uh, what is your resting heart rate? What's your blood oxygen saturation? So carry a little pulse oximeter that you can, you know, pop on your finger and check that. Check it in the morning, check it in the afternoon. And if you're doing um, a, a bigger trek or expedition where you are moving to multiple um, altitudes throughout the day, then check it again when you get up to that higher point and when you come back down. And also monitor how you're feeling like you're, are you experiencing any symptoms of acute mountain sickness? You know, so difficulty sleeping is one, um, feeling dizzy or lightheaded, um, really heavy level of fatigue, headache, um, loss of appetite, uh, certainly more, you know, uh, more significant ones would be not, you know, if you're feeling nauseous or you're vomiting. Now, feeling a little bit nauseous or a little bit of a loss of appetite in the beginning is also pretty normal. When we think about like the changes that are happening in our bodies, our bodies are working really hard to keep the vital organs going, right? So that means there's not a lot, you know, there's a lot of work going to get, um, get blood to our vital organs, to our brains. That means there's a little bit less going to potentially our our GI system or going to our muscles. So, you know, the body's working really hard to manage the vital stuff first. So it is pretty normal that you are going to feel a little bit nauseous or a little bit loss of appetite at first. Um, but it's really important to think about like making sure that even if you don't feel hungry, you know, you gotta, you gotta eat. Um, you gotta have energy because when you're um, heart rate is increased and your ventilation rate is increased. Even if you're just sitting around resting for a couple of days while you're feeling a little bit better, your metabolism is working a lot harder than it normally is. So that means that, you know, your base number of calories that you normally need to just breathe and exist is going to go up, um, significantly, you know, in those, particularly in those first, um, 10 days. And, and like for hydration status, because you're obviously taking more inhalations and you're exhaling more fluid requirements go up as well, I would assume. They do. And also think about, you know, the, the one big change that's happening in the body with the kidneys, you know, um, the kidneys giving that signal to dump plasma, you're also going to be like peeing quite a lot. So you're going to be losing a lot there. So it's really important that you stay on top of hydration and at least in those, you know, early days, if possible, avoid caffeine uh, or limit caffeine and um, certainly alcohol uh, because your kidneys are under a tremendous amount of stress and you don't want to give them any additional stress on top of it so that they can work their amazing magic for you. I'm sure that this is probably another, it depends question, but is there a point where is there a dividing line or whatever where it's worth riding the storm out and just giving your body a, the opportunity to, you know, maybe you take a rest day rather than a planned training day up high, or maybe if, if it's folks that are hunting, they stay in camp rather than going out. 
is there a point where you say i need to get out of here i need to go back down to lower elevation because it's clear to me that this isn't i'm not in a good way yeah and that's that's something to really pay attention to and that's why i recommend people to track their symptoms and share it like unless you're out by yourself you know you're probably out with at least one one partner or one buddy you want to make sure that you're sharing that information with each other because i've also seen situations where someone feels like you put a lot of work into your adventure right whether you're going out on a hunt or you're going out on uh, like you and your friends are planning for you're planning a a pretty significant you know multi-day mountain adventure you're really depending on each other and so everyone's worked really hard to get there. And sometimes people are afraid to share to their partners how they're really feeling. However, you could put yourself and your buddies in a pretty significantly bad situation if you're not sharing that, how you're feeling, because things can go bad pretty quickly. And, you know, you're going to be somewhere that's probably pretty remote. Um, it's not like, you know, one thing I found really different moving um to the U S and living in the mountains versus living, being in the mountains in Switzerland or all over the Alps, whether I was in France, Italy, even Morocco, I had cell phone signal everywhere in the mountains. <laughs> and that's not the case here. So, you know, you want to make sure for safety reasons, you know, to track your symptoms and share it with those that you are on your adventure with or in your camp with, so that you can keep an eye on each other and, you know, help each other out and notice those things. Um, so track those things. And of course, the first couple of days, you are going to probably have a little bit of a headache and feel a little bit tired or a little bit dizzy. So what can you do about those things? Make sure you're eating properly. Make sure you're getting good rest. Make sure that you are really paying attention to your hydration level and track your resting heart rate and your blood oxygen saturation. Over the next couple of days, you should see some improvements there. But if you see your blood oxygen saturation dropping after one or two days, or you are just really feeling worse after one or two days, then you're going to want to get down, you know, at least a thousand feet lower and see how you feel there. Is there a, is there a wearable pulse oximeter that can be trusted uh, that's that's already included like I'm, I'm thinking of a Garmin or something like that yeah there's they are still like it's, it's it's great to think that we could have technology like this that we're already wearing that's going to help us but in my experience and reviewing the data it's just not um accurate enough and there are also like so many things that can interfere when you're dealing with a risk-based optical sensor you know you're usually like if you're sweating it's going to be off if your clothing touches it and moves around it's going to be off so it's easier to i would say it's better for you to have an external device um that is specifically designed for that purpose yeah i knew i knew that they had just recently started putting you know quote unquote pulse oximeters on a lot of their wearable devices but i know like even whenever you're measuring calories burned or heart rate monitoring with a wrist-based uh, device. I, you know, I know the data is pretty all over the board in terms of it being effective. So I wasn't sure about that, but that's good to know that, they, you know, a, a separate pulse oximeter would probably be a good idea. Yeah. And they don't, they don't take a lot of space, um, you know, so that's a good thing there. Um, another thing to mention about the watches, you mentioned Garmin. It just made me think of this, Kyle, is that on Garmin, I know on the, I think it's the Phoenix 7 and a few of the other uh, newer models that were released uh, last year, they also have like an acclimatization feature. So it's monitoring like how much ascent you've had in a given day um, and where you're at and what it feels you might be acclimated to. Um, you know, again, it's there, it's, it's information, you could look at it, but I don't think that it's, you know, it's not something that I would base decisions on. I think it's really better to think about you know, it's good information and it's interesting to see how it correlates with how you're feeling, but the best tell of how you're doing is, you know, what symptoms are you experiencing and what's your heart rate? How's your heart rate looking and what is your, um, blood, sat uh, blood oxygen saturation looking like? I think those are going to be the best tells, uh, for you on a day-to-day -day basis. 
One of the best things that you said to me on uh, during our time together as we were sort of reviewing some of my own personal stuff was, yeah, the, the data is good, but don't live and die by it. <laughs> like, don't chase the metrics. It's interesting, and there are some standards to aim for just to get you a ballpark figure of of how to progress in your training. But also, don't not pay attention to how you're feeling and your abilities and those type of things as well. I think that that's good advice, especially for someone like like myself who is very data driven um it's good to to not forget to rule out the ultimate data which is my own head <laughs> yeah exactly and it's 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 interesting as a coach you know over the years seeing you know with more and more technology and having athletes saying like coach i can't do my workout today because my whoop strap said my readiness score is this I'm like okay how do you feel i feel pretty good i had a really good sleep well then get your butt out the door and go do your workout. (laughs) Yeah. I love that. I love that. Like the, the Garmin again, not, we don't get anything from Garmin at all, but they've got that feature about the training load and, uh, someone, I forget, I don't remember if it was an article I was reading or what, but someone made the point of exactly what you're saying. Paying attention to the training load is possibly leaving performance gains on the table for you. If it's saying stay home and rest yet physiologically, you feel fine. You could go out. I mean, that is how performance is built. It's very small progressive increases done over time that really reap a, a reward at the end of that. So I think that's good, good advice. If we, um, switch gears here a little bit. Yep. Pharmacology, like pill medication based remedies for altitude like the biggest one that most people are familiar with and always talking about is diamox is that effective are there other things that are therapeutic that could help at altitude is there anything like that that would be a good idea to throw in your day pack throw in your bag if you're going to be traveling somewhere to take if you were to experience that yeah this has kind of become an interesting thing um over the last couple of years where Dimox and and dexamethasone used to be, you know, things that might be prescribed in case you needed them. And then it started to be over the last couple of years that like we started seeing practitioners or even some guide companies like telling their clients, like, you're going to use Dimox, you're going to take it for two weeks beforehand, and you're going to use it every day on the climb. Um, and then you have now other, other guide, uh, services that will say like, you can bring it with you just in case, but please don't take it unless you really need it. Um, so if we, first of all, think about those two drugs, those are the two most common ones we hear about, um, in, you know, in this sort of circle and they're both very different medications. So we think about Dimox, it is, it is a pretty big diuretic. Um, and what it actually does is change the the um the pH level in your blood. And so that can it it can do, you know, I'm not going to go into the whole uh, you know, pharmaceutical uh breakdown of it all, but because it is a strong diuretic, it can help with certain symptoms, but also because it is a strong diuretic, it can put you into a bad position as well. So, um I say to most people, unless you have a reason for taking it, of course, I'm not a doctor. So let's put that out there first. Um, You know, always above all scope of practice. Um, Talk to your doctor about it and think about why you think you might need it. For someone who maybe has had some challenges um, acclimating, then maybe it's something that they and their physician feel is going to be helpful. So let's say someone has like severe sleep apnea and like it, and it doesn't go away after a couple of days, then that's going to impede their acclimation. And maybe for someone like that, it's going to be helpful. Um, if it's someone who is not acclimating because they have some other kind of health condition, then you want to think about how safe is it for them to go to altitude with that health condition? Are you masking something more serious that could happen? You know, and that's where I get a little bit worried for for some folks that maybe aren't thinking about the big picture. So, you know, talk to a doctor about it. But for some people, it can be helpful to to take a sort of a prophylactic to help them. Um, but if you have not had difficulty at at uh, altitude before, um, let your body go through the process because it's going to be it's going to be better better for you um, to let your body naturally do what it needs to do 
on its own schedule. Um, the other thing with taking Diamox, some people um, experience some uh, changes in their thinking patterns. So they may suddenly have a little more confidence about something than they should. And that puts them in a bad situation. They may, because of that confidence, become argumentative with some of their partners and they aren't aware of that. So that could, again, you know, something that could put um, put them or their, their team at risk. And it also can create this like weird um, tingling in the face, hands and feet. And if you're climbing or you are, let's say you're a hunter and you need that dexterity, that's also maybe not going to be the best thing. So it can be helpful for certain people. Um, it can be helpful to have as a just in case, um, you know, in your pack, but understand how it works, what it does and get some good advice on, on how and when to use it. Um, but typically it's used, you know, more in the, you know, either to help someone acclimate or to relieve um, more of the acute mountain sickness sort of symptoms. Interesting. I didn't know that about basically taking the pill version of liquid courage. <laughs> yeah. And I could imagine, I could imagine guides in particular thinking, do not start taking that stuff because the last thing that I need is you to argue with me, you know, doing something that's potentially yeah. risky. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So yeah, they, they just maybe put themselves in a little bit more um, danger than if they hadn't taken it. So, you know, again, for some people, it can be really, it can be really helpful um, if they have a reason for taking it. Um, but, you know, get some medical advice um, on it, learn what it is, learn what the side effects are, and make a good decision for yourself. Um, when it comes to dexamethasone, so some people might say like Diamox could save your climb, Dex could save your life. So for dexamethasone, that is not something that, you know, that's something that is taken when someone is having um, really severe symptoms. Now we're getting away from altitude sickness. Um, we are getting more into high altitude uh, pulmonary edema or uh, cerebral edema, something like that. And that's something where you need really serious intervention um, in addition to getting the person lower, um, you know, because it, it can it can escalate really quickly. Um, so, again, you know, talk to a talk to a doctor about these drugs, learn what they are, learn where they could help, um, but also learn the side effects and, you know, make a good decision for yourself on um, when or if to use these things. Um, otherwise, oh, sorry, go ahead. Were you going to say something, Kyle? Yeah, but no, please. You're, you, we want to hear you, not me. <laughs> go ahead. Oh, um, the other thing to think about is like other things people may take, um, maybe aspirin or Tylenol for headaches. Um, I would also, again, sort of use those cautiously because you don't necessarily want to blunt the symptoms of your body telling you something. So yes, you are going to have a little bit of a headache the first couple of days, but um, that should dissipate. And if it doesn't, if that is existing with other symptoms like dizziness, fatigue, et cetera, for several days, then that's going to tell you that you're going to need to get lower and get safe. And if you are masking that symptom with aspirin or something like that, then you are potentially going to put yourself into a bad situation and get you know, uh, be more at risk for something more serious or more severe. Um, the other thing to think about is your kidneys are already under strain, you know, being at a higher altitude, doing all the cool things that they're doing to keep you alive. Um, taking those types of drug put an additional stress potentially on the kidneys. And we want to try and avoid that if we can. Yeah, I think it's a, it's a good point about the you know, even seemingly harmless stuff like ibuprofen, there's interesting um, research out there that shows even like certain doses, higher doses of ibuprofen could blunt the response of recovery for the muscle because it reduces inflammation and the inflammatory response, like you had said, I think you worded it so well saying all of these responses above altitude are good. They're, they're, they, they trigger a response that helps you survive and stay up there. 
and even like inflammation in the muscle in today's world, everybody's like, Oh, you know, I don't want inflammation. I don't want inflammation. It's like, well, you do if you want some recovery. <laughs> so yeah. I think that that's a, a, a good point that even these seemingly harmless ones, not that they would be harmful, but could be blunting something, some sort of an effect that you want. There's a number of um, over the counter supplements, a couple made by outdoor specific supplement companies that say, Hey, take this, this will combat all that you need, um, from the ill effects of being at altitude. And so when you, when you dive in there and you look at the ingredient list of the products, they'll include stuff like, um, uh, like ginkgo extract under the idea that it increases blood flow. Any truth to that in your research that there's an over-the-counter supplement, something along those lines, that is going to have enough of a therapeutic effect to where it changes the game for you and allows you to really surpass the acclimating functions in the body that take place to get you acclimated? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. And, you know, there's all kinds of um, supplements out there to help this or that thing. Um, there is, there is actually some scientific evidence for a few products. Um, so, um, for example, if we think about things that are going to help our body adapt better. So in the case of ginkgo, um, taken in a therapeutic dose, there is scientific evidence to show that it can improve oxygen saturation in blood which is a good thing. Um, however, everyone is a little different. So what is going to be the correct therapeutic dose for that person? So that's where someone might have to do some experimentation, speak to a professional like yourself, um, Kyle, you know, that is, you know, actively working with these types of things to see if that um, might be worthwhile. A couple of other things that um, show some promise might be uh, beetroot juice. There's a lot of stuff, beetroot juice, beetroot powder, um, a lot, and then another one, um, is cordyceps mushrooms. So both of these, um, there's scientific evidence showing that these are, um, natural vasodilators. So that's going to improve blood flow. Um, however, I think about, you know, some of the studies that I've seen with, um, that I actually worked on in, in grad school, I did a few studies with, um, beetroot juice for some ski mountaineers. And I also did it for some on another project with mountain bikers. And in both of those studies, and they both had a pretty high number of participants, one third of the people um, found an improvement. One third of the people found no improvement. And one third of the people felt worse than normal. They had some uh, gut distress from it. So, you know, you could try these things um, and see and, you know, test them before, well before your adventure that you're going to do and see if it helps you feel any better or feel any different. Um, you know, it's you can always, you know, try and at least these are things that are not going to uh, potentially have big side effects like something like Dymox, for example. So is the is the effect with the beet juice and uh, one of the other ones that you had mentioned from like the nitric oxide being yes a vasodilator yeah. to mm -hmm. increase blood flow? <laughs> it sounds like like everything in nutrition and everything in a lot of these types of studies. It's like yeah, we need to do more studies to really be able to give you some sort of an actual yeah because there's such confounding evidence. But I think what you had said is really the best synopsis, which is this. People should experiment with themselves. And even if all the data in the world says this stuff is crap, but you get to altitude, you take it and you're like, this changed my life. Knock yourself out. Great. You know, yeah. placebos, placebos are powerful too. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah, if you, if you think it works and you feel that it works great. And the, and the, the main thing is, is that these are not harmful things. Like the worst you're going to get drinking beet juice, for example, if you test it out is maybe a bit of a stomach ache. Um, you know, or, um, a surprise when you go to the bathroom and you forgot that you consumed a beet product, you know, um, something like that. So, you know, you can, you can try these things and at least they're things that are not, um, going to be harmful. Just see if you, um, notice any kind of difference. Um, you know, it, it, you know, these are pretty natural things. I think like, otherwise, you know, we have to think about when we go, when we're going to higher altitude with all of these 
things that are happening in our bodies, our immune systems are going to be depressed, right? So it's going to be really important, you know, coming back again to how do you prepare, making sure that you are fit and you are healthy, that you are eating really good quality food before you go off on your adventure, because you may not have access to certain things when you're out there, right? So you're going to have to really plan um, what you're going to eat, how you're going to eat, how much you're going to eat, how you're going to stay hydrated, what you're going to use. And then also if it's, um, if it's a longer sort of expeditionary style adventure, you know, you can get away with a lot of stuff in a short time. If it's one or two days, you can get away with a few stupid choices, right? But if it's two weeks or longer, then those stupid choices accumulate pretty quickly. So then you're going to have to really think about um, being really conscious of what you're eating and how much you're eating. And you think about, as I mentioned, you know, the at the higher altitudes, we can experience a drop in our appetites and increased um, GI distress. So we want to think about eating really simple things, um, things that are simpler to digest. So you know, carbohydrates are definitely your friend for a couple of reasons. You know, one, they're easier for your body to break down at higher altitudes. And also when the carbohydrates are broken down for fuel, they actually release an oxygen molecule compared to um, fat or protein. So, you know, it's, it's a, a little bit of a help there. So for people who might be on um, high protein diets or I don't know, a carnivore diet or something like that, and you're going to go on a, a multi-day expedition, you're not going to be able to survive that way. So you're going to have to change the way you eat. You want to make sure that you don't want to make that change happen your first day on the mountain, or you're going to have a bad time, you know, because your body's not going to be used to eating that way. So you want to think about what's going to be available to you and how are you going to be eating and making sure that you're, you know, making sure that your body's used to taking in those things, especially if it's going to be like, some kind of a sports food or an electrolyte drink or some kind of recovery powder or I don't know, a mountain house meal or something like that. You're going to want to make sure that your body is okay with taking that stuff in before you go on the mountain and, you know, learn that your body is going to reject it. Is there anything else that you want to throw in here on top of all the excellent information that you've already mentioned? Maybe also just thinking a little bit about um, in terms of uh, altitude, one of the things you had mentioned to me, are there other things we can do to help acclimate? Um, and I might be sending your listeners down a rabbit hole now, and I apologize to you all in advance, but um, a lot of people ask about like altitude tents, you know, is an altitude tent worth it? Does it help, et cetera? Um, and again, we kind of come into the rule of thirds. We have a third of the people that tend to think that it helps them. Um, a third of the people that think that it does nothing and a third of them that feel worse because while they are using the altitude tent, they are more fatigued. It affects their training and their performance um, before going to altitude actually gets worse. So, Interesting. you know, it's, um, is it worth it? You know, it kind of depends, but um, you know, we think about in that case, when you're using like a simulated altitude, we have, decreased oxygen, right, which is simulating a particular altitude. But what we can't simulate is the reduction in pressure. So we're not giving the body the full um, experience that we undergo when we go to altitude. So it's not exactly the same, which means you're not going to experience all of the different um, hormonal changes and things like that in the body that you would experience with, with, um, with actual altitude. Um, and if you do do this kind of stuff, you've got to have basically, you know, um, in the scientific evidence where it has seemed to help people, we're talking over 60 hours of exposure minimum. Wow. And the optimal is 300 hours. So do you want to sleep in a tent that long or, you know, it's, it's, it's going to, compromise your sleep it's going to compromise your training it may compromise your relationships yeah, um, that's what i was thinking know, I was like, so, my wife would shoot me <laughs> if i said hey yeah, i'm gonna spend 300 so, hours in a so, tent <laughs> yeah that that would be that would be kind of interesting so you know it is an option and it for some people it can be helpful um 
The other thing that can also be helpful is what uh, maybe some people have heard referred to as poor man's altitude training, and that's actually heat training. Um, and so what's really interesting, um, actually, this is probably one of the coolest things I learned, Kyle, in my grad studies that made me go, my brain exploded, that um, certain type of heat exposure can elicit some of the same cascades um in our body as altitude does. So you could do some heat training and a certain type of heat training will send a very same kind of hypoxic signal to your kidneys to produce EPO and therefore aggregate your red blood cells and give you that um, EPO boost before going to altitude. And all you got to do is hang out in a sauna or a hot tub. Really? So it's not yeah. even because as you were describing that, what I'm picturing is so in Idaho, it gets miserably hot in mid July and, you know, like you could be out in the middle of the day and it's just baking. So I'm picturing myself out there in some sort of sun hoodie, which is still misery, just sweating it out. But you're not even saying that you're saying find a sauna, find a hot tub. Mm -hmm. And then what's like, what's the protocol to reach to reach what it is that needs to be reached to have the effects happen. That's the awesome thing. You don't need 300 hours. So what you would, <laughs> what you would do is you would ideally speaking. So for women, it can take a little bit longer. Um, men and women will respond a little bit differently to this, but um, for men, it's typically going to be about seven days of exposure. So what you would do is you would go and do your, you want to be sort of, we would call this like a passive sauna protocol and through the combination of the heat and the dehydration that is going to send a hypoxic signal to your kidneys. And that is going to signal the production of EPO. So you would do the same thing. You want to, you know, you start at 20 minutes or 30 minutes. If you can, you know, feel comfortable enough, I don't want anyone to pass out, <laughs> um, but you want to aim for 30 minutes. And if you do that sort of seven days, that's going to be, you know, put you at the optimal spot. And then to maintain that, um, to maintain that level of change, you just need one 30 minute exposure every five days after that. Um, and when you come out of the sauna, obviously you're going to be thirsty, rehydrate. Um, obviously I don't want anyone to be de dehydrated, but you're not going to pound an algae bottle. You're going to slowly sip and slowly rehydrate over the next couple hours. Um, for women, they are going to typically need a little bit more time uh, because women's women's bodies are different. So women's uh, body temperatures tend to run a little bit higher anyway, and particularly at the luteal phase of the menstrual cycle. So that has to be taken into consideration. So women are typically going to need a little bit more time. And if women are in that luteal phase of their menstrual cycle, they might actually have to do it a little bit differently. So they might have to go into the sauna first for 10 or 15 minutes, come out, breathe normally, feel good, then pop back in for 30 minutes. Interesting. And you have, um, again, in my my Google creeping before our consult, um, you have some pretty robust experience training female athletes too along this line, like in terms of knowing what they need at certain stages of, you know, their life, et cetera. And, and these types of, of sort of uncommon environments, which I think is, is just another fascinating field of study. I'm sure. Yeah. It's so it's, I don't know. I think like humans are amazing. Um, and yeah. the things humans do are amazing. And so for me, it, it's pretty fascinating to look at all of these different variables that exist with, you know, different, different people, different types of challenges, um, you know, different type of stuff that they're going to do and how bodies respond differently. Um, you know, when it comes to, to, you know, to, um, one of the things I alluded to is that for the sleep apnea, for example, that's more likely to be experienced in men than in women. Um, you know, women do have a little bit of an advantage um, going to higher altitudes, so they're less likely to experience the sleep apnea. However, they are more likely to experience the acute mountain si sickness uh, symptoms, but they're less likely to experience the more serious things like high altitude um, pulmonary or cerebral edema. Um, so that's, you know, kind of a positive thing. Um, women also have more body fat than men. So 
when they go to higher altitudes, they're still going to probably do pretty well with low intensity exercise compared to men. So they might feel uh, a little better than men do, you know, slogging it away on the mountain, which is pretty cool. Yeah. It's awesome. Fascinating stuff, Chantel. And I, I appreciate it. One of the things that, um, again, I, I loved about just your, uh, our interaction during, you know, my consult with you, as well as our emails back and forth and what you'd said, like, I loved your mantra, which is you said that your inst your first instinct is to always say yes and then figure it out. <laughs> and I love, yep. I love that and feel like it's such a good mantra because I mean, and I am, I am the king of guilt when it comes to this. I can get so lost in my own head and trying to data things to death. Whereas like sometimes the best approach is just commit and then go figure it out as things, you know, as things unfold. And I, I think that that mantra is an awesome way to tackle stuff when it comes to the mountains. Anything you want to leave with us, keeping in mind that, uh, and this is for anybody that's listening, uh, you have graciously agreed to come back and talk to us again. We're going to cover, which I, I appreciate because this has been amazing. And I know that everyone's going to really love it. Second part's going to be all about, you know, zone two training, different zone trainings, base versus specific training, strength and endurance, et cetera. Is there anything that you want to leave as a final bit of information for folks on this one? Yeah, I would say like, just, um, this is definitely one area where you don't want to look for, you know, it's natural for us as human beings, right. In this day and age, hustle, hustle culture, looking for a quick fix. Um, this is an area where you don't want to be looking for a quick fix. Um, this goes probably to altitude, um, you know, exposure or altitude performance as well as your regular training. Like it's, um, the unsexy basics are important. And there's, you know, you, these are sort of, this is sort of one area where you don't want to try and rush. Like your body is really well designed and give it the support that it needs to, um, to adapt. Because a lot of times people are looking for like, well, what can I take? What can I, what can I take? Or how can I make this faster rather than getting proper rest, eating healthy, balanced meals, making sure that they're healthy beforehand, doing the training before going, all of that stuff is way more effective for you than, you know, taking a pill. And there's my rant for you. Oh, I love it. And if anyone listens to this, they're used to it. I'm always like the, the mantra is master the basics and do them with relentless consistency. There just is no love shortcut. It. And um, I, I would agree with you hundred percent. And I can't, I truly can't thank you enough for spending time and, you know, sharing the knowledge that you've got. I know that it's going to be immensely helpful for folks and thank you. And I look forward to, um, I look forward to the second part. Yeah. Same here, Kyle. Thanks for having me. I want to be sure to thank Chantel for joining me. She joined me twice. Both episodes went way longer than I'd anticipated, but she kept giving better and better information. And in part two, our conversation just um, continued to flow and you'll learn so much about training and um, heart rate zones and nutrition and really how it all works hand in hand to better prepare us so that whenever we go to take on some sort of an objective, uh, we're, we're not deficient. So join us for that. That'll come out on May 17th in two, uh, two weeks. If you've got any questions that you would like us to cover on the podcast, please send those over to info at v2pnutrition.com and we will most certainly get to those. If you have found this episode or past episodes helpful, would you take just a couple of minutes and um, you know rank it in your podcast platform, leave us a comment in there or even share it with a friend. All of those are tremendously helpful to us to continue to grow the podcast and try to get uh, good practical information out there for folks who are interested in having it. We'll be back again, like I said, in a couple of weeks for part two. Have a great week, everyone.